I think it would be pretty mean of me as a teacher to assign you the story, The Jilting of Granny Weatherall, and just kind of expect you to, to get it, to, to just understand uh, everything that's going on in the story, because it's a it's not a difficult story. That's not what I mean. It's it's a story that, that can be interpreted in, in several different ways. And I think the, the interpretation, several different interpretations, uh, can also be several different valid interpretations. So uh, for the student who's listening to this uh, sound file right now, who is expecting to get answers for what is this story about? I can't really promise that you're going to get what you're looking for here. What I'm going to do in this video is just kind of go over what I think are some important presences in this story uh, and things that put I'll go through some interpretations that I have, uh, and they are interpretations that I, I hope I'm grounding in the reality of, uh, as I'm, I'm hopefully trying to prove my interpretation with some line support here. But please don't think that this is the right way to read this story, because, you know, there are several different ways you can read this story, and uh, isn't that what makes it fun? I mean, this story's been around for a while, and we're still discussing it. Uh, in a in a critical setting, and I think one of the reasons why this story has such length in discussion is because it's a complicated story that's rich with different interpretations. Um, you know, just for an example that I think perfectly illustrates my little preface here, who is Hapsy? Uh, and that's, I've taught this story for years, and I still don't have a definitive answer, in my heart at least, uh, for I'm 100% sure this is who Hapsy is. Now, I'll tell you who I think she is, but um, by by any means, feel free to look at other interpretations. Or if you feel like you have a different interpretation, please, please share on the discussion board uh, what your interpretation is of what's going on in this, in this story and why. Okay, so let's jump in. So one thing that's really important to pay attention to in this story is the style that the story is told. This is a very unique style. And I can't really think off the top of my head of stories that have a similar style. Um, it's very much a stream of conscious, it seems, uh, as far as some students are a bit put off by the story because they have trouble following it. And I think that's because it seems initially that there's not a lot of logic to how the points are connected. Now, I argue that there is some logic there, but we have to pay close attention uh, to the Kellen, the the character of Ellen, uh, and we have to understand what's important to her. We have to kind of anticipate where her mind is going before it goes there to kind of understand the stream of conscious flow. And I think the reason why the stream of conscious style is important, it helps set up that there's basically two realities of this story. And I know that sounds weird, but uh, I, I do think that's important to understand. I think it's important for students to understand this story. They have to understand that we have the reality that's the physical reality. Uh, this is going to be where Granny Weatherall is on her deathbed, and she has the vitter, visitors that come and go. But then we also have an internal reality where it's not Granny Weatherall, but it's Ellen. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I think it's important uh, to Note the difference between Granny Weatherall and Ellen. But the internal reality is where Granny uh, Weatherall is, is in her own mind. Uh, it's that uh, kind of a constructed reality based off of memories, based off of the life that she has lived, but not the life that she's currently living. OK, and we'll come back to this dual uh, reality when we get to interpreting what's going on. So. Something important to pay attention to in this story is the punctuation, because this can help you see that uh, Granny Weatherall is not saying out loud everything that she thinks she's saying out loud. There are quite a few sentences uh, that she assumes she's saying out loud, but there's no quotation mark around it. And so um, I think that the punctuation kind of helps us understand the confusion of the people who are uh, in her deathbed room with her, as well as some of the frustration of Granny Weatherall, where she is, in her mind, talking to some of these characters, telling them to do things. They're not doing it. And it's not because they're being defiant or anything. It's because she's not saying this out loud. Um, the 
the voice is also very interesting. And, and like I say, I can't really think of another story off the top of my head where we have this combination of third and first person voice. Uh, it shifts back and forth. Uh, and I, I, I brought a line here just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So third person voice is going to be uh, he, she, it references. Uh, she thought, he said, things like that. First person is going to be the I references. Um and the story flops back and forth uh, really quickly and, and jarringly sometimes. This line shows, she could not remember any other sorrow because this grief wiped them all away. So we're in third person voice there. Oh no, there's nothing more cruel than this. I'll never forgive it. So notice in just two sentences, we've switched from third person voice to first person voice. And this happens throughout the story. Now, I think this kind of adds to the disorder of Granny Weatherall's mental state. Uh, and, and that goes into my next uh, line here. A lot of stories, excuse me, a lot of students read into this story as uh, insightful for a character who's suffering some form of dementia, specifically Alzheimer's. A lot of uh, readers interpret Granny Weatherall's overall state of mind to be an Alzheimer's-induced state of mind. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it makes sense to me. Uh, and, and I think that it's interesting that some of you may be listening to this and you've unfortunately known people who've suffered from some form of dementia or who may have suffered from Alzheimer's. Uh, it's, it's terrible, but it's interesting. One of the terrible dimensions of it is to most people, someone suffering from dementia or from Alzheimer's, we don't really know what they're thinking. Um, and we see how frustrating it might be for the person suffering from the dementia or the Alzheimer's because there is a logic in the story. There is a logic in Granny Weatherall's mind. The problem is it's not a logic that's easily accessible to those around her. And I try to give an example here of, of kind of a logic that we see for Granny Weatherall's state of mind, that, that basically she connects things that do not seem connected, but there is a connection. And Granny Weatherall sees that connection, but the problem is not everyone else can, uh, including the reader. We really have to work at it. Look at the line here. This is a line where Granny Weatherall is, is basically uh, hearing Cornelia's voice, and Granny Weatherall thinks to herself, Basically, uh, she thinks of a, a simile of what Cornelia's voice sounds like. And as soon as Granny Weatherall's mind forms this simile, the simile gains life in that second reality. So this is where we have kind of a blend, an amalgamation between the two realities of her physical reality there on her deathbed and her internal reality. And look at how they're melded together in a way that makes sense but it doesn't at the same time. Cornelia's voice staggered and bumped like a cart in a bad road. It rounded corners and turned back again and arrived nowhere. Well, that's a pretty neat simile for describing how Cornelia's voice sounds. But notice that all of a sudden the simile gains life and Granny actually sees this cart in front of her. And it says, Granny stepped up in the cart very lightly and reached for the reins. So this is just to show that her physical reality and the observation she makes, it morphs in her internal reality. And this kind of simile that she thought of, it gets life. Uh, and, and it's something that she's standing in front of and looking at and climbing up inside of uh, in her second reality, that internal reality. So let's pause and take a breath here and try to digest what we've gone over so far as far as just the style of how the story is written. I think it's very successfully done to let us know that we don't just have a crazy person here. Granny Weatherall, there is a logic, but it's a different kind of logic than we're probably used to. And it does take a little bit of work for the reader to, to make the connections that might be there. Or maybe these connections aren't really there. Uh, maybe I'm reading into uh, some of these things and some of the connections that I'll continue to make. Uh, notice scrolling down a little bit, it, it's ironic that we have here a deathbed story. 
And I think pretty much we understand early on that Granny Weatherall is on her deathbed. There's all these clues of, like, her family's gathering around her. The priest is coming and performing the last rites. Like, there's that thing about uh, tickling her feet, which that's uh, a last rite thing. So there's all these really, they're more than clues to us. There's all these signs that let us know that this is Granny Weatherall's deathbed. But it takes Granny Weatherall by surprise, even on the last page, close to the very end of the story, she's somewhat startled that death is here. She has this realization of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm dying. I can't die yet. And the irony here is she's already prepared for death once. And I think this fits with our PowerPoint uh, that we've looked at in class uh, or on our uh, in our online material, we looked at that death PowerPoint, and some of the examples talked about how death uh, can happen at any time. Uh, when it's unexpected is when it may show up. We'll continue to read literature about this, specifically a poem called Out Out by Frost, which is a great poem, but talks about just kind of the um, when you would least expect to find death is when it may show up. Uh, it's ironic here that, you know, years ago, uh, like decades ago, uh, Granny Weatherall got sick with milk leg, which I'm not sure what that is, but I guess like Google it, right? But she got real sick, and so she basically got her affairs in order and prepared for death to come, and it never did. So that could be kind of a jilting in itself. Uh, we'll talk about all the jiltings that seem to be going on there uh, in this story, but that may be one that uh, Granny Weatherall was prepared for death once already, years before, and death didn't show up. The second time, She's not prepared. She's caught off guard when death is here. And I think we know death is here. Unfortunately, Granny Weatherall also realized this, but it's just at the very end of the story that she uh, realizes it with a start, that it's caught her off guard. And it's a bit ironic that she's already prepared for it once. Uh, 20 years later, uh, it's, you know, she, she's not ready to go. Now, let's talk, a point I mentioned earlier was Granny Weatherall versus Ellen. This is the same person, but it's not. And hear me out on this. Granny Weatherall seems to be the woman that Ellen became once John died. And we know that uh, Granny Weatherall was married to John. She mentions John several times. We'll talk plenty about John. But there's this kind of division in Granny Weatherall's life of who she was before John died and after John died. And John's death really did change her and change her into that Granny Weatherall persona. Look at the name there. That's a symbolic name, Weatherall. She talks about all the stuff that she's had to do. She's weathered it all. Uh, and she's done so as best as she can. Uh, and here on her deathbed, she, she kind of looks back with pride, uh, knowing that she she didn't do too bad. Uh, but we also have Ellen. And Ellen is um, a woman who Granny Weatherall is afraid that when she sees John again, John won't recognize her because John died so so long ago uh, that even her children are, are older than John would be when he died. And so here's a quote that kind of shows this fear that Granny Weatherall has, and when she meets John again, how she's a different woman, and John won't even recognize her because she's no longer Ellen, uh, she's Granny Weatherall. This quote says, John would be looking for a young woman with the peak Spanish comb in her hair and the painted fan, digging post holes, changed a woman. So here we have here the woman with the Spanish comb, that would be Ellen, but we also have uh, when John died, Someone had to do the work necessary, uh, and that person was Ellen, who, who through the responsibility she adopted, uh, became Granny Weatherall. She's afraid uh, that her husband will no longer recognize her. So let's talk about George and John, okay? George is... I call him George the Jilter. That's the that's my little pneumatic device so I don't get them confused. And John is her husband, who she married and had several children with. Um, let's talk about George. George is the Jilter. And jilting is basically when, uh, you know, the word is specifically for uh, 
when you don't show up to a wedding. It happens a lot in literature, actually. Uh, I mean, think about Great Expectations. There's uh, this idea of jilting and the long-term consequence it can have. Uh, this devastating ev- uh, event of, you know, usually it's uh, portrayed as a woman who is uh, on her wedding day waiting to be married, but the, the bridegroom never shows up. And uh, the destruction that that can have. So there are, I mean, it never really comes right out and says it. Uh, but we have some lines here that make it clear that George uh, was an earlier love uh, who had promised to marry Ellen and did not fulfill that promise. And here's a quote that kind of shows this. This is where uh, Granny, Weatherall, uh, Gra- Granny Weatherall is thinking. But he had not come just the same. What does a woman do when she has put on the white veil and set out the white cake for a man and he doesn't come? So this idea of she prepared for this wedding, and it's a wedding that he never showed up for. George did not show up. He jilted her. Uh, Here's another line that helps us. Don't let your wounded vanity get the upper hand of you. Plenty of girls get jilted. You were jilted, weren't you? Then stand up to it. So this really lets us know Granny Weatherall here was jilted in her past, not by John. We'll talk about who John was and where he was when this jilting happened, in my opinion. Uh, And then we have one last line here that helps us understand uh, what George did to Ellen so long ago. Since the day the wedding cake was not cut, uh, but thrown out and wasted. Uh, How terrible uh, of an image is that, that something is beautiful and and something is, you know, costly and as symbolic as a wedding cake is just thrown out as trash. So we'll get back to uh, George. Uh, It's interesting because Granny Weatherall, a.k.a. Ellen, says several times that she doesn't care about George anymore and she's not thinking about George. And we know that's a lie. And we'll talk in just a little bit of of why we know that uh, Granny Weatherall actually does think of George much more than she's actually willing to let us uh, maybe to admit to. Well, let's talk about John, okay? Uh, This is my opinion on who John, uh, where he may have come from, and it's based on basically a line that I keep coming back to. Uh, This is just my opinion, so feel free on the discussion board to challenge it or, or support it. Uh, I really think that John was uh, there at the wedding. John was someone that she knew. It may have been a friend of George. I don't know. But it seems like he was there when Ellen was jilted, when George did not show up for the wedding day. We have this quote, and this quote makes me think that John was there. John saw what happened, and John was there as a rebound to catch Ellen in this moment of crisis. The whole world dropped out, uh, excuse me, the whole bottom dropped out of the world, and there she was, blind and sweating, with nothing under her feet and the walls falling away. So this description just shows the panic and the chaos that her world turns to when she realizes she's been jilted, when she realizes George is not showing up. His hand caught her under the breast. She had not fallen. There was the freshly polished floor with a green rug on it just as before. He cursed like a sailor's parrot and said, I'll kill him for you. Don't lay a hand on him for my sake. Leave something to God. So I assume this is John, who's there to catch her when she falls, literally, uh, when she swoons, he's able to lift her up. Uh, and we'll talk about what what state that uh, Alan could be in at a time of this wedding that John would uh, maybe feel this extra incentive to be there for Ellen to support her. Uh, where where George has le- has left, and that's what we'll talk about when we talk about Hapsy and who Hapsy is. So bear with me on that. We'll come back to uh, the significance here of her being jilted at this wedding, and the the significance of John being the rebound that she attached to. Um, and at the end of her life, she still does think of John, but she's also thinking of George. And we have a few lines here that I want to look at that let us know that George is still pretty heavy on uh, Ellen's mind. I can't help but think of uh, Titanic, and I, I don't know why. I do know why, but it's, it may be silly. You know, Titanic, great movie. You've got Rose, and then you've got Jack, and they have this you know, love affair on the cruise ship that's very short-lived. However, she's an old woman telling the story, and we understand that Jack has had a profound effect on her. Even though their romance was short-lived, it was enduring. And so uh, when Rose 
made it home. She lived her life. She got married and had kids. And it's interesting that when she dies at the end, which, spoiler alert, I guess, but gosh, if you hadn't seen Titanic, uh, whatever, right? Uh, but when she dies at the end, and she, there's that scene where she returns to the Titanic, and it's kind of the, 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 the heaven symbol that she goes to heaven, and there she finds waiting for her, not her husband, who she raised children with, uh, and she lived a life with, but there waiting for her is Jack, uh, holding out that hand. And that always kind of got to me. It's just kind of like, okay, well, you had like a week with him, maybe, uh, and and you spent the rest of your life with a husband, and when you go to heaven, he's who you, I don't know. It's just kind of what I think of here uh, with that idea of George and Jack, that George may be that first love, that passionate love that Ellen had. Uh, but, uh, uh, John, George and John, sorry, but, uh, George was that passionate first love and John was the, the, maybe the love that grew, uh, over maybe necessity and over, uh, maybe not as much passion, but, uh, maybe friendship, maybe just, uh, uh, a comfortable life, uh, that, that John would provide. Uh, and notice here that she thinks of letters that she's kept. And she's kept love letters from both George and John. And she thinks it's kind of, I think it's kind of a, a funny spot in the story that, you know, I bet we would all think of something that if we were to die tomorrow, heaven forbid, uh, we'd think of something of, oh man, I hope, you know, somebody doesn't come across this because I'm not there to explain it. Uh, and for Granny Weatherall, she thinks, oh man, I better do something about those love letters because she's kept not only John's letters, which is understandable, she's also kept George's letters. Uh, and she kind of wonders what would happen if the kids found these. Um, it makes her uneasy and she makes a plan of, of doing something as soon as she's back on her feet. Uh, and then we have a direct line here where it seems that uh, Granny Weatherall is able to admit to herself, to actually voice to herself that she feels differently about George than what she's been telling herself. Before, she's been telling herself that she doesn't care about John, uh, George. Sorry, She doesn't care about George. She doesn't want anything to do with George. Uh, George doesn't matter to her. Uh, and here, she has a bit of a, not really a change of heart, because I think her heart was always here. Uh, she just is honest with herself and says, yes, she had changed her mind after 60 years, and she would like to see George. I want you to find George. Find him and be sure to tell him I forgot him. Uh, what a funny line this is. This reminds me of the the Duke a little bit as far as in My Last Duchess. And that Duke who thinks he has control uh, over his last Duchess because he has that portrait that he controls. But we know better. We know that she may be controlling him a bit. Uh, I like this idea of, you know what, find him and be sure to tell him I forgot him. Which, of course, she's not forgot him. Uh, George is still very much on her mind. Okay, let's move on to Hapsy. Um, I'm going to do my best with Hapsy. Hapsy's a tough character. In fact, in all the literature I've read, uh, excluding like William Faulkner's stuff in Sound of the Fury, um, Benji and things like that, Hapsy's one of the tougher characters for me to play around with. Because there's two basic roads that I see. Uh, as pretty valid roads, and I have a road that I find most valid that I tend to go down. You don't have to go down that road, but uh, I want you aware of the road for test purposes and stuff like that. So we, we, we seem pretty clear. One thing about Hapsy we know for sure is that Hapsy is uh, Granny Weatherall's favorite child, and she's also not there. Um, someone who is there throughout the story is Cornelia, and it's ironic. I, I thought it was kind of mean, but uh, I, I talked to students, and some students have told me in similar situations uh, where they're taking care of their parents, and there are brothers and sisters who aren't as there as they are for their parents and taking care of them. And they tell me that this is, the story is actually quite accurate to what can happen as far as you may be there for your parent, but your parent takes advantage of that. Uh, I think Cornelia is pretty abused in this by uh, Granny Weatherall. Uh, Granny Weatherall's really hard on Cornelia, and Cornelia is the one who's there. Uh, and and I've had students say that that's how it is. That sometimes parents that they're taking care of are are hard on the ones that are there, and they are uh, kind of idolizing children 
uh, who are not there. And I, that's just fascinating for me. Uh, but I think it is present here as far as Hopsy's not there. But we make it clear that Granny Weatherall wants more than anything for uh, to see Hopsy again. So there's a scene that's a weird scene. It's kind of a... Um, a surreal scene. It's in that second reality of her mind and not her physical reality. And I think it kind of helps us understand a bit of who Hapsi is. Okay. Uh, I, I tend to think of Hapsi as uh, Granny Weatherall's child. I tend to think of Hapsi as a child who's no longer alive, uh, that Hapsi is dead. Um, it's debatable when she died, but I'll talk about when I think she may have died. And it's uh, basically. This scene that we have uh, sets up this kind of religious significance as well. Uh, and there's religion throughout this story. I mean, religion seems important to Granny Weatherall. Uh, she basically is given her last rites. Uh, she has a moment where she has kind of a, a prayer. Uh, so I think it makes sense for the story anyway to have a Trinity presence. Uh, let's go ahead and read the scene. It was Hapsi she really wanted. She had to go a long way back through a great many rooms, and these rooms are in her mind, keep in mind, these aren't actual physical rooms, but this is just kind of in the recess of her mind. She has to go a long way back to find Hapsy standing with the baby on her arm. She seemed to herself to be Hapsy also, and the baby on Hapsy's arm was Hapsy and himself and herself all at once, and there was no surprise in the meeting. So this is a line that throws a lot of readers for a loop, but how I take it is that we have here Hapsi, and Hapsi is a combination of himself and herself. Uh, Hapsi and the baby uh, on Hapsi's arm seems a combination of himself and herself. And some students are like, well, who? what are the pronouns there? Who is himself and who is herself? I take this to be uh, Hapsi's father and Hapsi's mother. And personally, I take it to be George and Ellen. I find that Hapsi was the child uh, that uh, George impregnated uh, Ellen with before he jilted her. This would explain why George would agree to marry her. Uh, and, I mean, why would someone agree to marry someone and then jilt them? Uh, this kind of goes back to maybe, a, you know, the, I hate to be crude about it, but like a shotgun wedding. Uh, this idea of, well, she's pregnant, so... He has this expectation, uh, this, this obligation to marry her, but he doesn't follow through with it. So this helps understand why George jilted her in the first place. Um, it also may help understand why Hapsi is so precious to uh, Granny Weatherall, why Granny Weatherall wants to see her so bad, uh, because Hapsi is a product of, of her and George and their love. Uh, when it was alive, uh, before he jilted her. Uh, and so she's a product. The rest of her children are products of uh, her her love with John and her relationship with John. And I find that Hapsi, uh, maybe she's so precious because she's the product of, you know, her relationship with George, which came before. Um, this would also make sense as far as, you know, a child uh, is a mixture of the mother and the father. So uh, this goes back to, you know, uh, this the idea of the Trinity of three things uh, being different, but all the same uh, linked. Uh, that, that makes sense for a mother and a father and a child to be linked. Uh, they're different, but they're also the same. Uh, and so I just find that the Trinity here is uh, Ellen, George, and Hapsi. Um, it's odd that she's a woman here holding the child, and some students don't really know what to do with that. And honestly, I don't either. This raises, was she, when Hapsi died, if Hapsi died, how old was she? Uh, most people think that it was in childbirth. We'll look at a couple lines that support that. But if she died in childbirth, was Hapsi delivering the child or was Hapsi the child being delivered? And I tend to think that um, Hapsi died as an, basically in, in delivery like she was being born from Ellen and that she died or she died shortly after or maybe uh, it was a miscarriage. Uh, the miscarriage makes sense to me because think about if Granny Weatherall was pregnant, Ellen was pregnant at the time of her jilting uh, from George, uh, 
you know, one of the worst things you can do in pregnancy is to, especially in the early, the first trimester, is to suffer severe stress that can really cause some complications. And I can't think of something more stressful, especially in this time period, uh, as far as being a woman who is pregnant outside of wedlock. Uh, and I wonder if this is an explanation that explains uh, why Hapsi died, if she either died in childbirth or maybe she didn't even make it to term, uh, and the stress of the jilting caused her to be miscarried. Uh, that's a dark reading, but I do think we have some lines that can possibly support it, including this one. Uh, She's talking about here, she's thinking to herself, if she were to see George again, what she'd want to make sure George knew. Uh, and basically, she wants George to kind of tell him, you know what, I didn't need you anyway. Uh, I, I got everything in my life that you would have given to me. Uh, you didn't take anything away from me. I got everything that I would have had with you uh, had you have even stayed. But notice here, she doesn't have everything. She says, tell him I was given back everything he took away and more. So when he jilted her, She's basically basically saying, if I could tell him that when he jilted me, he didn't take anything away from me. But she catches herself. Oh, no. Oh, God, no. There was something else besides the house and the man and the children. Oh, surely they were not all. What was it? Something not given back. Her breath crowded down under her ribs and grew into a monstrous, frightening shape with cutting edges. It bored upon, uh, it bored up into her head, and the agony was unbelievable. Yes, John, get the doctor now. No more talk. My time has come. And really, this line makes me think about this realization that George, uh, he was not able to give back the baby that she lost, the baby that was born from George and herself, and that baby being Hapsy that she was able to make a new life with John, but she never was able to get back that first child, Hapsy. And notice here, she's talking to John. Yes, John, get the doctor now. No more talk. My time has come. This makes me think about time of delivery uh, for Hapsy. And notice that this is, you know, this goes back to the weird stream of consciousness. She's in agony. She's talking about the pain uh, and, and, and the agony in her head. And immediately it links from this idea of agony in her head to this idea of childbirth, possibly Hapsy's childbirth. Um, and just to repeat, you know, if you think about jilting, someone being jilted, uh, someone being stood up on the altar, uh, especially if they're early in pregnancy, that could have, of course, devastating effect. So hopefully that gives a little bit more understanding of who at least who I think uh, Hapsi is. But just to recap, uh, I tend to think that Hapsi is that uh, basically she, she's like a, a symbol. She's the life that could have been if George had shown up at the altar. Hapsi is that life. Uh, Hapsi uh, was lost potential. And although George was, uh, excuse me, although John was there to catch her when George did not show up, uh, John could not give everything that George took away. I mean, she says this in this line that there was something not given back. And I tend to think that something not given back, sure, uh, George gave her another child and in fact gave her several children, but he was not able to give her Hapsy. And I think that's important. Uh, this also explains why she's never been able to get rid of George, uh, because they, there can't really be closure there. So let's talk about the story's end, because um, a lot of students read this story and they find it terribly sad, terribly pessimistic. And I actually say that this is not a sad story, that it's actually a story of hope for us, the reader. And a lot of students are thrown by that. But stay, stay with me and, and hear me out. Uh, and, and I'll try to defend why a lot of students and a lot of uh, critics tend to see that the story's end shows that Granny Weatherall is jilted yet again. Uh, maybe not even a second time. It may be a third or a fourth time, depending on how many you want to count as a jilting. But Granny Weatherall is waiting on something, and she's specifically waiting on a sign, a sign from God. And she basically is in despair because she says that sign does not come. Uh, I'll read, this is the end of the story, and it's a very dark tone. Uh, Granny Weatherall thinks to herself, God, give me a sign. For the second time, there was no sign. 
again, no bridegroom and the priest in the house. So the priest in the house now is not the priest waiting to marry her, but it's the priest giving her her final rites. She could not remember any other sorrow because this grief wiped them all away. Oh no, there's nothing more cruel than this. I'll never forgive it. She stretched herself with a deep breath and blew out the light. And so that's a hard line to kind of spin into a positive direction. But I, I think that the trick is you don't try to spin that line into a positive direction. You have to back up a bit in the story to find where a positive end actually is. Uh, remember, we have two realities. We've got the physical reality, and then we've got the reality that's the constructed reality, the mental reality, the comfortable reality, where instead of being Granny Weatherall, she can be Ellen. Uh, she doesn't have to worry about being that woman who's been affected by digging the holes for the fences in her brain, in her mind, in those corridor, corridors that she's walking down. She can be Ellen. Um, Think about the implication of asking God to give you a sign. Um, that implies that you're going to be able to understand the sign that's given. I mean, you can ask God, give me a sign, but you're assuming you're going to be able to recognize such a sign when it's given. Uh, and I think of the a proverb I remember hearing uh, about a man in a flood. And the man is uh, caught by uh, floodwaters. He crawls up on top of his roof, and the floodwaters continue to rise. Uh, he's stranded on his roof, and the man prays, and he says, God, uh, you'll save me from the storm because I'm one of yours, and I know that you'll protect me, and I know that you'll save me from this floodwater. And a boat comes by, and someone driving the boat uh, throws a life raft out to the man, and the man says, no, no, I don't need this, and throws it back and says, my God will take care of me. Uh, I don't need help from you. And so the boat drives off to go rescue other people. Uh, the man says another prayer, God, please, uh, I, I know that you'll uh, protect me. I know you'll take care of me because I'm one of yours. Uh, please, please help. And, you know, uh, an hour later, another boat comes by and the boat pulls close to try to rescue the man. And the man shoes the boat away and says, no, no, go on. Uh, I don't need your help. Uh, my God is here to protect me. And so the boat drives off. And shortly after that, the floodwaters overtake the house and the man drowns. And the man awakens in heaven and he goes before God. And he angrily says to God, I don't understand. Uh, I was on that roof and I knew that uh, if I had faith that you would save me and you didn't save me. You let me die. And God says, well, I sent two people to rescue you and you uh, you didn't take my help twice. So I think that's a perfect illustration here of kind of the logic that Granny Weatherall has. She's saying, God, give me a sign. And I think we readers have already seen that that sign's already been given. Uh, it's been given, but in the alternate reality. I know that sounds weird, but she's in the physical reality asking for a sign, a sign that's already been given in her mental reality. She sees Hapsy. Uh, Hapsy does show up. She's not jilted by Hapsy. She doesn't see Hapsy in her physical deathbed room because Hapsy's dead, but she does see Hapsy. Uh, and, and in fact, it says, uh, Hapsy came up close and said, I thought you'd never come, and looked at her very searchingly and said, You haven't changed a bit. They leaned forward to kiss when Cornelia began whispering from a long way off. Oh, is there anything you want to tell me? Is there anything I can do? So here, Cornelia wakes her from this comforting uh, reunion she has, Ellen has, with Hapsy uh, in her mind's reality. Uh, but it's like this, she's awakened from a dream into the harsh reality of being back on her deathbed. Um, I like here that, that Hapsy's talk with her shows the her fear of John not recognizing her is an ungrounded fear because Hapsy says, you've not changed a bit. Uh, and I like that because, you know, it just shows that where she's going, the piece of where she's heading to in this transfer, whatever's next for Granny Weatherall, uh, she'll face it not as Granny Weatherall, but as Ellen. Uh, and that she doesn't have to worry about John not recognizing her because Hapsy, her child, who's been waiting on her for so long, says she hasn't changed a bit. So I find that quite comforting uh, 
uh, as far as I'm sure, uh, there have been many people who've had similar worries of, you know, when the time comes and they pass on to what, whatever's next. Um, loved ones who haven't seen me in so long, will they recognize me? And here uh, we have the comfort that yes, yes, they will. Um, there is also a scene where we have this happy tone of uh, Granny Weatherall being Ellen instead of Granny Weatherall and, and, and feeling joy. Uh, yeah, I like joy. I think it's joy. It's close to joy, if not joy, uh, in, in, in what's going on. But this isn't the physical reality. Uh, it's that second mental reality. And this is when that uh, carriage uh, shows up, the carriage we talked about earlier. And it says... Uh, it, it basically, to me, symbolizes a happy meeting with death, uh, meeting death um, as, a, as a friend rather than as an adversary. Granny stepped up in the cart very lightly and reached for the reins, but a man sat beside her, and she knew him by his hands, driving the cart. Now, let's pause here. She did not see, uh, She did not look in his face, for she knew without seeing, but looked instead down the road. So here... The carriage driver is a man she recognizes by his hands. And I don't know exactly who this could be, but let's talk about some possibilities. Who would be men that she would recognize based on their hands? Well, could be George, could be John. It could be our Reaper, right? Because the Reaper would have those skeletal hands, as we've seen in some of the examples in our PowerPoint. But it also could be Jesus. I mean, that would make sense for Jesus to be driving the cart and have recognizable hands because they'd have the uh, the nail scars uh, for where they were driven through. So I, I think it's important that you understand, uh, even if the reader is not a religious reader, that Granny Weatherall is a religious woman. Uh, and, and so that impacts the story we have here quite a bit. Whoever the driver is, and I don't really know who it is myself, I go back and forth on uh, who I take the symbolic driver to be. She's not afraid. Whoever the driver is, it's a friend that she recognizes. Uh, she looks down and uh, down the road where the trees leaned over and bowed to each other, and a thousand birds were singing a mass. She felt like singing too, but she put her hand in the bosom of her dress and pulled out a rosary. This is, I think, uh, think about that link between comfort and reaching down to that rosary, that token of uh, spiritual faith uh, and spiritual devotion. And I think it's important here that there's this connection, like she feels like singing, uh, and it mentions about birds singing a mass. We've seen this bird image before uh, in, in one of our examples from the PowerPoint, uh, The Sound of Her Wings, where we have uh, a, a bird link with death as far as death not being a descent, but death being something where you take flight, that you elevate to something else. So I think it's important here that uh, Ellen feels like singing. And by the end of the story, she certainly doesn't feel like singing. But that's that, that physical reality here in her mental reality, uh, the reality that probably matters most. She is at peace. She's happy. She feels like singing. The problem is that she wakes up one last time. Uh, so I think this goes back to this idea we have from the story that as far as when it comes to death, that the physical world will prevent comfort. But your internal world can help you confront death, uh, not only with, with peace, but also possibly with joy. And I know that sounds creepy, but I think it's because death uh, especially in American culture, is a very taboo subject. It's something we don't talk about. We don't want to look at it. Uh, it's scary. Uh, but think about how much literature... I mean, it's a big deal. Everybody dies. So I think that it's interesting to look at literature, and I think it's powerful, it's magical, that if you can get literature that causes you to re reflect about something as important as death, as mortality, uh, not with fear but just with reflection and contemplation and hopefully with peace uh, as Granny Weatherall is able to get uh, eventually in her uh, mental reality. So thank you for bearing with me in this story, uh, the, the discussion video for this story. I hope some of the ideas are valid enough for you to where you uh, can, can use these ideas to make the story uh, make a little more sense to you. I think it's a good story. I think it's 
good on several levels. Personally, I find it just comforting uh, for myself as far as looking at the reality of death uh, whenever it comes, uh, knowing that it doesn't have to be a scary thing. It doesn't have to be something that takes you off guard. It can be something that you uh, recognize the carriage driver and you climb up and you go down that road with a song in your heart. Um, but also I think it's just a neat story and how it's written. There's a lot of cool author stuff going on here that helps Granny Weatherall be a very, although challenging, uh, character for us to understand. She gives a dimension that's a, a, a unique dimension for someone who may have, you know, uh, just a, either Alzheimer's or, uh, you know, just maybe uh, transitioning into uh, the next life. So uh, anyway, let me know your comments. Let me know your questions and let me know, uh, you know, criticisms you may have with my interpretation. You won't hurt my feelings on the discussion board. Thanks, guys.